All right, we are back here, Studios Mag Live from Eugene, Oregon. We're joined by our next guest, Peyton Otterdahl, who just qualified for his second Olympic Games in the shot put with a third place finish. Uh, um, for, and, and first off, I'm a little weary of just kind of the seating situation. We had Josh uh, Awatunde on our show two years ago, and I looked so small, so I have no <laughs> idea what it looks like on screen right now. But that's what I love about this sport is just sort of like, you know, the many different shapes and sizes that comprise this U.S. Olympic team. So congratulations, a, a second team. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Yes, that is one of the great parts about our sport is no matter your body type, you can come out and there is an event that you can compete in. <laughs> totally. Uh, so for the men's shop competition, it was thrilling this time around. You had a front row seat to, to all of it, I guess. Take us through sort of your experiences, each one of those those rounds that went. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. men's shot put right now is just so strong. We knew that it was going to be a super deep competition heading into this, and you know that's exactly what it turned out to be. Um, it's it was kind of made a little bit more exciting than usual because you got Joe, the world leader, coming into the meet. Ryan, world record holder, who's been hurt all season. Like you don't know what kind of Ryan's going to show up. You're you're knowing that he's him, and he's going to show up and throw <laughs> something big regardless. And those two go huge round one anyway. So. It was a very exciting competition. Um, I made it a little too exciting for my friends and family on my behalf with uh, kind of a slow start to getting going, but uh, it was awesome. Uh, got the job done and we're excited to go on to Paris. We're sending a very strong team. Yeah, of course there was a sweep, what was it, two years ago in the men's shot at Worlds. Um, this time around, Take me through, I guess, like your sort of assessment of like the global landscape. Leonardo Fabri is like throwing amazing so far this mm -hmm. season, but you know, looking at the greater landscape of the shot put, like how do you size it up and how does the U.S. compare? Well, uh, I can tell you that I'm more nervous for the trials, or was more nervous than I will be for Paris. I Joe mean, has said that before when you know when he made his team back in 2012 and 2016. It's just sort of like a, this is the one where it's like if you mess up, like this is the high stakes one. And then once you go out there, you feel good. The trials is an absolute gauntlet, and if you're looking in the the top ten, uh, the top list of you or of uh, world shot put right now, I think it's something like seven are Americans. So. This is the hard part. Uh, Paris, it's going to just, you know, qualifying for the team is what has everybody nervous. Now we can have fun, let loose, and uh, try to get that American sweep. Yeah. In the last couple of years, what is, you know, Joe and Ryan have just been like the staples. You were made the last Olympic team. What kind of has changed in the, in the, in the men's shot put in the United States that everyone just kind of leveled up year over year where you look at the, t the marks it takes to make the team, it, it only gets tougher. It's, it's kill or be killed in the men's shot put. You, you either got to elevate your game or you're going to get left behind. There's just too much talent in this country. I mean, if, if we're being real, we need to send all those top eight guys to the Olympics well, for the U.S., but unfortunately, we only get three, so That's what the it's ultimate championships three. are coming along for. Yes. I don't know what the exact stipulations are going to be because, like, there's so many events where I feel like the U.S., you know, if it ends, if the ultimate championships end up being, like, U.S. sweeps left and right, I'm sure they'll, they'll alter the rules, but the shot put is one of those events where just, like, we're so deep. It is, and, and, and in certain events like the men's shot, um, we are leaving behind some of the best athletes in the world. Uh, it, and that's what's interesting about this Ultimate Championships coming up, because if they're sending the top 16, at least in the men's shot, it's going to be half Americans. Uh, we're truly getting the highest level of competition then. Uh, we're always leaving behind some of the top people at every major from the U.S., so it's going to be really exciting. I am super excited to see what that's going to look like. Truly, having the pinnacle of the of a competition that we can have for our sport. For you, the six best marks of your career, I think, like to open up the season, right? Is is that stat right? Yeah, yeah. Every every meet so far has been over my personal best from last year. And what what's clicking so well this year in particular? Uh, just. Technical cues, this sport is, is something that you get better at with age. I mean, if you're looking at Ryan and Joe, I'm still the young guy compared to them. And uh, they continue to raise the bar going into their 30s. I'm 28, so I'd like to think that the, the best is still in front of me. Um, and it's a very technical event. You know, you just need the reps to get better. So uh, 
just technical improvements and then 2022 I'm coming off of a hip surgery so last year was kind of testing the waters of that I lost a good part of my off season because of uh, the recovery from the hip surgery and the rehab this year I'm able to have a full off season and year to, of growth and really keep pushing the boundaries uh, being mostly injury free this is a track and field like uh fanatic show so i want to get technical i want to hear some of the the ins and outs and these minor tweaks that, that okay. you may have made over the last couple of years like speak thrower to me because if it does make sense to me you know i'm sure there's people out there who are interested in some of these technical cues i could see what are, what are those accounts like thrower's universe and all that stuff cliff, clipping things so you know what 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 are some of the adjustments um it's just very small stuff at this point um my throw personally, the things that I've been working on are mostly setting up the throw properly out of the back because if you screw up the back, it screws up everything in the mm -hmm. front, especially for me. So properly setting it up out of the back, getting over my left leg, not cutting that edge okay. on the rotation. You want to load it properly around the edge before you come in. And then in the front, <clears throat> staying on the shot put. Sometimes I have a, a bad habit of jabbing at the shot quick jab to the hand that's that's kind of how the trials competitions went for me um pulling away with that left side i don't want to pull because that's energy going not into the shot put at the end of the day we're trying to put everything into that shot put no wasted energy that's mm -hmm. what makes a great throw so if i'm pulling my left side away that's energy that's not moving through the shot put so that's one of the more things to work on and it's just very small stuff that you know yeah. most people have like no idea they just think like we go out there and just hit it as hard as we can but the reality is um i like to compare uh shot put it's it's like golf you know one yeah. small thing because so much is happening in such a short amount of time uh one small thing that screws up it's going to affect the rest of the throw. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a fraction of a second. So yeah, it's, Our producer, it's interesting. Mac loves the technical stuff, so he's got a question. Yeah, I, I love this stuff. stuff. Um, do you take anything from other throwers? And if you don't, how hard is it to stay true to your own technique and your own form? Because I'm sure watching you know, the likes of uh, Joe or Ryan and seeing maybe some of the things that they do, we're like, oh, maybe I can do that. But if you start doing that, can you get away from what's best for you? Yeah, for sure. I'm always looking at other throwers because at the, at the level that we are as pros, everybody's doing something really, really well. And it's taking those things from other people. Now, I can't go out there and try to replicate Joe's form, you know, as a mirror image because we have different body types. He is way stronger than me. I'm taller than him. My levels, like my levers are longer than his. Uh, same with Ryan. He's bigger than me and he's taller than me. So his levers are even stronger than me. But I can look at certain things of their throws and be like, yeah, I can try to incorporate that into my own um, and, and and try to piece that in, work on that and practice. And if it clicks, it clicks. If it doesn't, that's something I, I move away from. So yeah, always taking little bits and pieces from all these other pro throwers. When you compared it to golf earlier, I know for a fact Joe loves to get out on the links. Are you a big golfer too? I can tell you I'm an awful golfer. <laughs> and, and, and that's funny because I know that a lot of these pro shot putters, they are good golfers, yeah. uh, but I am not one of them. I am my I can hit the ball far, but I cannot hit it straight. So uh, that's kind of my issue. I, my short game's not bad though, I will say that. I don't play too often, but my short game is pretty good. I'm a good chipper, I'm an okay putter. I'm a terrible driver. Where else does sort of your your strength and just like the throwing skill set come out? Like outside of the shot put, like what are some other areas of athletics or life that you're just like, all right, this is where my uh, my form comes in handy? Yeah, uh, I would say it's actually pretty close to golf. It's uh, frisbee golf. Oh, disc really? Golf. That's okay. that's more my speed. I like throwing things, <laughs> so I'm not too good with a, a club. So. Throwing things, that's that's all my style, and I do like uh, disc golf. That's one of my favorite just like physical activities to do outside of training and track. Uh, and on the mental side of just sort of this sport, it's fascinating because for the past, what is it now, like almost, almost a whole decade of just Ryan's dominance at the top, Joe being there since you know 2013 as well, that like these are the two guys who just like it's been hard to knock them off of any sort of u.s team how do you mentally approach like something like the trials like i know the elite athlete thinks i can win like you want to put yourself in contention to win it's hard when those are the two guys you have to beat. 
you don't frame it as like a battle for third or, or do you, how did how do you approach a competition like this where sometimes anything can happen there are surprises at the trials yeah i mean we see upsets all the time in this sport anything can happen to anybody on a given day those two are just on a whole nother level it's it's kind of motivating to me because they are they're number one and two of all time they are the best two in the sport and they're active and they're in their prime right now i as as a up and come well i wouldn't say up and comer but you know as a guy who's just a little bit of a peg down from them it's super motivating i i want to beat those guys more than anything because if i am able to beat them i'm beating a absolute legend of the sport mm -hmm. so uh that's all the motivation that i need to continue chasing them and uh hopefully just get lucky on any given day the 2019 world championships in doha is arguably like the greatest competition ever what would have to happen i guess like in uh Paris to try and top something like that. Honestly, it's it's definitely a possibility that Paris could be deeper than Doha. It's we're sending just a, such a superstar squad from the USA plus uh, you know Fabri, Tom Walsh, Rajendra. You can't count any of these guys out from other countries. We could see uh, you know five six guys over twenty two at the final wow. there, which has not happened. I I, I can't say exactly. What is the meet with the most guys over 22 meters? I want to say it might be that that 20, uh, 2019 meet. I think it had four or five, but we might see that eclipse this year. Wow. So, you know, obviously you see in, you know, at the stadium, all the cameras following around the sprinters for their own, you know, Netflix documentary series. I'm of the thought process that I think like the throwers would make like a very interesting series as well. Just sort of like all the different you know, backgrounds, you know, you've got obviously the footage of Ryan out there fishing, Joe being a dad and, you know, training from, you know, with the, uh, the setup that he has in his own sort of backyard. If the camera started following you, what would your sort of like training look like? Um, and then your day in life. Yeah. Day in the life. I'd say probably the most interesting thing about me is I have a lot of pets. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of like the, I'm like the Sandy Morris of men's <laughs> shop, but I have snakes? eight snakes. Oh. Uh, wow. A gecko, a lizard, a dog. Um, I think that's all I have, but uh, <laughs> that's always changing. But uh, yeah, I have tons of pets. That's kind of my big time hobby outside of track. When did that? When did this all start? When was the first snake? And then that? What, what told you I need seven more? <laughs> <laughs> well, it started at a young age. Like when I was a kid, I grew up in Minnesota. We, my family, had a cabin in Wisconsin. And we would go there almost every single weekend, and I'd just spend the entire weekend, you know, flipping over lo fallen logs or you know walking the the shore of the lake, trying to catch whatever I can. And my parents encouraged me to do it. So um, once I kind of grew up and stopped looking for things to catch uh, and had money, I, I could kind of get some cooler stuff and give them really great enclosures in my home, like. I don't know. I just get a lot of satisfaction from building uh, a great enclosure for my pets and something that, like, watching them interact with the environment that I made for them. It's, I just enjoy that. I love that. You come from a throws family. Like, what has that kind of been like for this to have been something that you've grown up with and at the same time, like, a meet like this when you make the team? And what is sort of that family celebration like? Well, it's great. I have two little brothers, and I say little, but they're they're bigger than me. I'm I'm six four, three hundred and seven pounds, and I'm the runt of the litter. Oh my I have, gosh! Uh, the middle brother, Trevor, he's six six, uh, not quite as heavy as me because he was more of a hammer thrower specialist. And then the youngest brother, Max, he's six nine, and he's about three fifteen right now. So, uh, and then I also have a cousin who's six seven. He wasn't a thrower; he was a basketball player. But uh, I'm I'm the small one in my family, so. Uh, being able to just kind of lead as an example for my little brothers is super motivating. Um, one of them just graduated. He's no longer throwing, but uh, Max is still a student at the University of Nebraska who has really high hopes of uh, continuing to compete post-collegiate. And uh, I just want to set the bar high for them. You know, they don't compete against me maybe head-to-head -head right now, but I know that they were always competing against the, the me that was the same age as them. So... Uh, Max is always chasing, uh, you know, the the fourth year Peyton in college. He's trying to beat those marks, or the fifth year Peyton, and uh, I'm trying to make it as hard as possible for him <laughs> to beat uh, me at that age. 
Uh, who cooks at Thanksgiving? Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of food to make. It is a lot of food. I know that the grocery bill for my parents <laughs> skyrockets whenever we're all home at the holidays, <laughs> and and we we eat heavy, so uh, it's definitely hard for my parents when we come home. Uh, I know that they saved quite a bit of money once we all went off to college. The New York Times did that feature a couple years back when it was like following Joe and and uh, Ryan when they were in town for the Milrose games, and it made a big deal about just sort of like the amount of food that they ate. I think they actually like went to a restaurant and just like you know listed out everything that they had. Or is what's your sort of diet like when it comes to in the bulk of training? I don't do anything like counting calories or any of that. Yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm not like feeling hungry ever. So lots of snacks. I try to eat about five meals a day. Um, I used to kind of be like, all right, I'll eat three huge meals a day, snack is needed. But now I've kind of tried to spread it out, get more meals in a day, maybe not feel like absolutely stuffed and bloated after a meal, but then eat again in two hours, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, just making sure that I, I don't have my tummy rumbling because I got to stay well nourished. Yeah, I, I think one of the best things is the lunch boxes that I guess like the, the throwers the throwers bring out like during competition. What's in yours? <laughs> I can't say that I've ever brought out uh, a, <laughs> a food in competition besides the, the you know the small snack, but uh, I don't like to feel weighted down when I'm throwing. I like to feel a little bit hungry yeah. when I'm competing because that just makes me feel like you know I'm. I'm, I'm locked in. I'm hungry for a good competition. So yeah. uh, I don't usually bring too much food to it, but I always bring lunch to practice to eat in between uh, my throwing session and weights. So uh, whatever that is that I'm cooking that week is what I bring with me. From the stands, just sort of like, you know, you talk about that actual sort of like hunger for good competition. Like the fans really get into, you know, the throws here inside Hayward Field because it's so up close. And one of the things that stood out to me about the 2022 World Championships is just seeing sort of like Ryan makes a big throw and then Joe is kind of like on the side and he's doing those sprint outs that I think that he does, like um, just to kind of like, I don't know, get fired up. What are you sort of like when you're at your most intense in competition? Is it more internalized? Are you doing stuff like Joe's, you know, full blast sprints? Mostly internalized for me. Yeah. Um, I don't do any anything like that. Um, just usually I'll take like one dry run, full throw footwork outside of the ring off to the side somewhere. And if that feels good, then I feel like I'm dialed in. But other than that, it's mostly internal, just trying to stay relaxed. I, I do better if I'm not too wound up. If I'm relaxed and having fun, that's usually when my best comes out. And then everyone can have, you know, their big in practice sort of, you know, with the distance runners, like your fastest rep in practice or fastest 400. I mean, do you have like a really memorable throw that is a practice, like a crazy practice throw that's out there? Or, you know, has it all, do you find a way to tr make it translate just in competition? I usually add quite a bit of distance to competition for my training. Um, but yeah, I have, we throw different weights in training. Yeah. I throw everything from the 20 pound shot all the way down to the 14. Um, throw those lighter weights for, for over speed when we're getting in the season. I throw the heavier in the off season to build that strength. But I have my PRs listed for every single one of those weights. So anytime I set a new PR in training, I'm always super happy to go into my notes app and update whatever that mark is. A lot of updating this year? I've updated every one this year so far. So I love that. Um, all right, my our some one of our summer interns, his name's Paul Hoff Mahoney. We call him Pauly Throws, big throws guy. Uh, he, you know, sent in a couple questions, and one of them was actually very funny. The photo on your Wikipedia page, have you ever seen it? Sadly, I have, yes. So it's you dressed up as Riley Dolezal. What's the story behind this? Well, that was, let's see, that had to have been my fourth year of college when I was growing my hair out long, um, and I needed a, a good idea for Halloween that year, so uh, Riley Dolezal many time world championship team member for Team USA, many time US champ. He trained at NDSU where I went to college and I, I just showed up to practice one day dressed as him and he was there. And uh, someone took my picture of me holding the javelin. Yeah. and In the uh, USA kit and everything. Yeah, and actually I, yeah. I know who put that as my- Oh, you do? Yeah, that my buddy freaking made an account on, <laughs> Wikipedia. on Wikipedia so he could update and mess with my <laughs> Wikipedia page. <laughs> And he put that on there. And he probably could have used some little less flattering pictures. I'm sure he's got plenty of embarrassing ones. I should be happy that he used that one. But I'm waiting 
please, if anyone is out there, update my Wikipedia <laughs> page. <laughs> update my picture, my information on there. It, it needs an update. Please, I'm begging you. I don't know how to do that. All right, permission granted for someone to use the Sidious Mag photos uh, to update the Wikipedia page uh, for Peyton over here. F uh, the final question that Paul sent in was... Uh, how is Peyton Oderdahl in Paris going to be different from Peyton Oderdahl in Tokyo? Uh, I've done a lot of growth since then. A lot has changed in those three years. Um, I would say that at the trials in 2021, I wasn't supposed to make the team necessarily. I was. I think I came in the meet ranked fifth or something like that uh, and managed to throw a, a personal best at that meet to make the Olympics. And I hadn't thrown a PR in two years since college. So... Um, I usually tell people, you know, I kind of just got lucky and put together a, a throw. Um, and then I was just kind of taken in the whole experience. You know, the, the Olympics was my ultimate dream to just be at the Olympics. So I was soaking everything in, in, in Tokyo. My technique wasn't, you know, where it should have been going into that meet. So I didn't have the best meet. I ended up finishing 10th. But this time around, I've, I've done a lot of growth as a thrower. I understand my throw much more. I know how to make technical corrections, you know, if my coach might not be there. And um, I just feel overall a lot more confident. So this time around, I'm feeling confident going into the Olympics. I want to do some damage there. I'm not just there to experience it this time. I, I want to have fun and, and do something there. Uh, I, got, I got one more question for you. Where do you see your, your biggest gains to make are over the next four years? You know, like, where do you think that you can grow the most and, and really push your your throws out further uh, I would say mostly on the technical side there's always things to work on there's always something that you can do on the technical side to be better and and I still see even like th on a PR throw I can still see things that need work so um, that's probably the biggest realm that I could improve on but also on the physical side too in the weight room I could be stronger you know Ryan and Joe they're they're way stronger than me so if I can get a little bit stronger while increasing the technique, I think that the distance will go up. And how, and how much time does that take to improve in the weight room like that? Like, you know, we all see their lifting videos and whatnot. And, and Joe, in, when you guys were at UCLA, I think was causing a scene inside of the, the student gym there. Um, is that just like a really slow process of gaining that strength in the gym? It takes an off season. You can make some huge gains in the off season, especially in the weight room. Um, Obviously, once we're in season, we're, we're trying to peak and taper. Let's do the slow taper throughout the season for the important meets. But uh, it takes a good off season. And honestly, and at least in my case, I can say it takes being healthy. Um, usually, I'll be pretty strong coming off the off season. But once the throws start ramping up, like we can get pretty strong as throwers if we're only throwing. Then you add all the twisting and crazy positions of throwing in. That's at least in my case, that's usually where the injuries show up. So staying healthy, continuing to build the weight room progress, I think, would, would really help for that. Um, one, one thing I was wondering when you were kind of sharing sort of like even your own sort of progression within the sport was what was sort of like and, and talking about how you've got your younger brothers who are kind of chasing, you know, your former self. Was there, you know, now you're with A6, you know, you're signed, you know, professional athlete there everyone knows kind of like the field events and the throws can sometimes be sort of that area where there's a lot of athletes who don't have those sponsorships and you know it takes a lot of their own sort of financial resources to make that olympic dream and to, to just simply chase it was there a moment where you said okay this is what i want to do professionally and i'm gonna you know go after it no matter what that despite like some of the early challenges that a shot putter might face yeah, I mean, it is definitely hard in the realm of sponsorships. I know that, uh, you know, I don't know how far the world rankings go in events like the 100, 1500, the distance events where athletes are sponsored, you know, into the 50s and 60s and the world rank. Um, it took me, I've been, I'm world rank five and I just signed with ASICS. I know athletes that are in the top 10 right now that are unsponsored top 15 unsponsored and it, it is hard uh, financially so it really is kind of crazy how men's shot is just so elevated right now when there is not much financial backing for us um, who knows what heights it could reach if, if we had the backing and the interest from the bigger companies uh, like the other events do 
but um, yeah, it, it is interesting to see what could be. We're hoping that that changes in the near future. Yeah, and obviously one of the buzzy topics so far coming into these Olympic trials is that you know we're seeing this great investment into track. I left off and field because that's how it's kind of been framed with just sort of Michael Johnson's Grand Slam track and then Alexis Ohanian's you know all women's meet that is just sort of you know six events in September and a lot of the athletes are getting asked about it just sort of in the mix zone as to like what are you know your thoughts to being left out and you know Joe had some pretty strong remarks that were not you know as harsh as some of the other athletes are going at these new concepts but joe was like you know i applaud what michael's doing and you know i want to see it succeed that and hopefully leads to a trickle down but you know for him he's like he'd love to see some of the throwers you know go off and do some of the strongman stuff and he's been you know familiar with that scene for a little bit without having like actually competed but because that crowd does understand you know some of the technique and the ins and outs of shot put and what you guys do in training what are your sort of thoughts as to like what could the shot put do while you know all this stuff is happening on the track side of things but you know for you guys to really find your own sort of i mean finding a place that is awarding that much prize money it's a long ways away but where where do the throws turn to now I honestly don't know. That's that's a tough one. It's I don't know if it's an exposure thing, like maybe if we just need to be given the chance that some of these other places have. I don't think that it's that the throws are boring necessarily. They're not. I just think that maybe we don't have the exposure or just the opportunity to get out there. I know we have a lot of characters. Like We know that everybody loves the sprinters' personalities and the runners' personalities. Everyone loves that. We have just as many... On, among the throwers, uh, if, if they're just given the chance to to have a voice out there and, and kind of get a little bit of attention, um, that could definitely be there. Yeah, but yeah, like dipping into the world of strongman, we know how popular that is. Strength sports are insanely popular. There just kind of needs to be a crossover episode between the track and field throws and strongmen. We could just as easily host, you know. Uh, a shot put competition at you know the Arnold Classic or at these strongman competitions just off to the side heck I do it outside the building <laughs> just on the street outside I think that would draw a huge crowd um, also getting just you know the common man involved too would be cool I don't think people can conceptually realize how heavy a 16 pound ball is like we're if you go to a bowling alley take the biggest bowling ball they have there is 16 pounds and then you condense it into 129 millimeters, that's heavy. And people don't realize that. So maybe uh, giving them a chance to really see that. Um, I did an indoor meet at the marathon trials in 2021 in Atlanta, and they let people sign a waiver. At, I think it was after the comp. It'd be even better if they did it before the comp so people can really realize it. But after the comp, they let people sign a waiver, come out and throw the shot put. And uh, people were just like, oh my gosh, like, we had no idea it was this heavy and and they got a whole new respect for what we do as athletes so just let let the common person come out and just handle the shot put before we throw that that right there would give them uh a newfound respect for it oh i 100 percent agree i think when we had val allman and coach zeb on our show last year we had them basically take hey take one look at us like what do you think we could throw in the discus and under you know uh <laughs> coach zeb's training like how far could we make improvements in about like well, i think we said six months and then a year and you know it was a really fun thought experiment so look at me now how far do you think i could throw <laughs> these are twigs i i think that you could maybe throw the shot put the 16 pound shot put <laughs> yeah I'll give you 15 feet. All right, I'll, I'll take it. It's 15 feet longer than I thought I'd be able to throw it. Um, 15 feet. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, no, shot. no no shot. No shot. Max, Max says no shot. I'm, I'm saying no shot. We have to actually go do this. I really want to do this. We have to go do this. Especially, yeah, we'll be working with ASICs at the Olympics. Maybe you know we might film a video where you coach me up. Yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, Peyton, I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, congratulations on making the team. Lots of exciting stuff ahead. What do you have to do now, I guess, like between, what is it? We've got five, six weeks until Paris. Like, what does training look like? 
Well, enter a little bit more load. You know, we have to peak a little bit for this one to move on. So enter a little bit of a load phase and then hit another peak for the Paris Olympics. Um, obviously work on those technical things that are still a work in progress. Um, not really get any stronger at this point in, in, you know, those six weeks time. There's not a lot of gains that can be made, but we can kind of enter a heavier cycle mm -hmm. and then re-peak for it to try to be at our best. Awesome. Well, best of luck in, in the training and thanks for stopping by to, you know, our little City's Mac pop-up right above Prince Puckler's ice cream. Why, go get some ice cream. Like yeah. it's, it's a free ice cream hour, I think right now for oh, really? a couple more minutes. So, well, um, let's see if the hour, we got about 45 seconds. I'm sure if you uh, show him the tattoo and let him know, I think you, you'll get a comp well, I might have or to do just that. tell him it's on us. Yeah. Yeah. Might have to do that. Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate it, Peyton. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me.